Welcome to the Tech Recruit um, Learning Lab. Today we have Lou Adler, who is the author of Hiring and Getting Hired. You see that, which is chock full of all kinds of fantastic information. If you haven't had the opportunity to pick it up, is, is this it has a couple editions, doesn't it, Lou? No, that's only got one, but uh, I've got four or five books out there, but that's the most recent one. Fantastic. So um, if you haven't had an opportunity to pick it up, it's got information such as what to look for in a candidate, the type of questions you should be asking to close candidates, and also how to find out what the job description is really about. Some really, really great stuff here. Um, anything you want to add about your book here, Lou? No, other than you can find on Amazon, and we have special discounts. Uh, well, that's not totally true, so I don't want to add lib too much here. Now, I think you've covered all the, the good stuff, Stacy. Good, good. Well, Lou and I have uh, go way back, actually. You've spoken at four of my conferences. You were the keynote at my first four conferences, actually, um, in Los Angeles and Chicago. And um, so we've asked you if you would come back and do a learning lab with us, which you were so nice to say you would and you would offer your time. And today's topic is hiring in a time of uncertainty. So Lou, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. I have a almost daily recruiting show. I just started this week. It's every Monday and Thursday. Uh, 10.57 a.m. Pacific time. You can sign on with the hiring.tips slash recruiting daily show and attend. And I go live with it as well as uh, conduct it on GoToMeeting or Zoom. And what I do is I just have people ask questions. So what I'd like to do is have a few people throw in their questions in the chat and I will answer them real time. And prior to that, I'll just give a quick introduction to our whole program and then answer any questions. And Stacy, if you have questions that you want answered, feel free to ask them as well. And I'll answer them and we'll go as long as we need to go. It could be 10 minutes, it could be four days. Well, let's hope it's not four days because uh, while I'm quarantined, I still need to eat lunch. Uh, but this is kind of, I find interesting, is when I wrote my first book, Hire With Your Head, and it was in 1997, and I wrote it based on 15 or 18 years of recruiting at the time. Actually, I wrote it in 95 or 96, got delayed in publication. I had to rewrite it and updated it. And uh, the book, Hire With Your Head, actually came out in 1997. And then I had the cartoon drawn. I just was looking at the state of technology 22 years ago. And it seemed like a lot of people were paying money for job boards. They weren't getting a lot of success. People were complaining that nobody was seeing their job postings. And I read them and they were pretty boring. And surprisingly, they're pretty boring today too, not changed at all, which makes no sense to me. People had this cumbersome process. They had bad systems. They were trying to build ATSs that were terrible then. And now they're, I don't know, I guess they're better. Uh, but a lot of people never been recruiters. So they started screening people and box checking and hiring managers weren't very good at interviewing. And it was almost impossible for a candidate to find a job. Uh, this was 22 years ago and you would think given all the promises that none of those things uh, would be around today. But I took a survey last year with about a thousand people and said, what's different? And nobody could say anything's different. We still always have boring job postings. It still takes a long time to get seen. Hiring managers still uh, misjudge candidates. It's still hard for a good candidate to get the job through technology, the best candidates bypass that and they get a referral into the company and recruiters still box check skills and they don't get along with the hiring manager so you say what's going on here it makes no sense uh so i wrote a book that this is 22 there's three editions of this one the current hire with your head or the essential guide for hiring up Stacy just mentioned so i've changed the rules and i changed the rules 40 years ago is i never hired for the start date and i think that's the fundamental problem i hire for the anniversary date meaning a year after the person starts, uh, the candidate says, I'm glad I took that job a year ago, and hiring manager says, I'm glad I hired that person. Well, that's fundamentally different than today's hiring process. And yet, I've been doing it successfully for 40 years, and the 1,000 or 2,000 recruiters we've trained 
do that. They get exactly the same success. They don't do any of this stuff on the left. They do stuff on the right. So let me just summarize quickly what that is, and uh, we can ask questions. I'll put end it. The idea is that if you want to hire a great person, and everybody does, that hasn't changed since I've been around 50 years ago or maybe 45 years ago when I became a manager. Everyone wanted to hire good people, and last week they wanted to hire good people. Well, I'm going to contend if you want to hire a good person, you can't do what you're doing today. you got to start with a great job, and that's not a laundry list of skills and experiences. It's a list of four or five KPOs, key performance objectives, or OKRs, objectives and key results, that define the actual work. Then you got to go find people who want to do that work. And I source semifinalists. A semifinalist to me is someone who can do that work, who's been recognized exceptionally for doing that work, and would see the jobs or career move. You get a good person who can do that work and has been recognized for doing it. Hiring managers will instantly see the person. They only need to see three or four people to hire one. And if you can find 10 or 12 people who are semifinalists, uh, you can narrow down three or four who would obviously take that job. So to me, sourcing is uh, a lot of pre-qualification before you, you don't need to be a great bullying expert. You got to be good enough to find semifinalists, but you got to be a good interviewer to demonstrate that you've conducted an accurate assessment. Uh, the candidate's motivated to do that work and the candidate would see the job as a career move. And that requires the hiring manager and the recruiter to be good at interviewing. And then you got to close the deal on the career growth. Money will always be number one unless the recruiter makes it number two or three. And the way you make it number two or three is you offer a career move that's far superior to anything else with a competitive comp. And if you have a, a rational person who's the top third person, they will see that, hey, uh, you get a bottom half person, it's all about the money. Top half person, no, it's about the career opportunity. And if a recruiter doesn't understand that, they're missing the behavioral economics of how top people make decisions. But then you got to clarify the expectations through onboarding, and then you got to deliver on the promise. That's our win-win hiring methodology, hiring for the anniversary date, not the start date. Everybody wants to hire great people. But you have to have a process that with the goal is, I'm going to raise the talent bar, and I'm going to embed post-hire performance, hey, this is what it takes to be a great person, into the pre-hire process. And it's interesting that we hire strangers differently than we hire acquaintances. If you know someone, you focus on, and because you've observed their work patterns, you you hire them based on their ability to do the work in your environment, learn quickly, make an impact. We change the rules when they're strangers. Oh, I've got to have 10 years experience, have to be interviewed this way, have to make this kind of first impression, I have to go to this school. We already know that strangers, the, their performance is unpredictable. And that's why that cartoon I drew off is still effective today. We're still hiring strangers using the wrong process. I convert strangers to acquaintances before they become candidates, and then I implement this process. That's what performance-based hiring is about. That's what win-win hiring is about. That's what our daily recruiter show is about. Given that introduction, let me see if there's any, now, now it's up for you. It's up for Connie, Jill, Sam, Mary, Stacy, and Joe, and everyone else who's on this call to ask a few questions. Because I'm not going to answer, I'm not going to make this a lecture. This is a talk show. Uh, it's a laboratory. So tell me, Connie, anybody who's on this call, what's your biggest hiring challenge you're now facing? And I will try to do my best to give you some information with respect to that. Uh, they're going to have to use the chat. Do you see the chat down there, Lou? I see it. I'm, I'm, I'm on Q&A. Where is the ch chat's not, is it different than Q&A? Um, it's kind of the same, but uh, well, I'm Connie looking at Q and A, and I says chat. I mean, I haven't have any questions come in yet. Yes, Connie has a question. Well, how come I don't see that? That's interesting. Maybe I'm because I'm not an organizer, so you have to tell. Oh, maybe it's over here. Hold on, I it's see not. something. Ah, okay, I do see it. Yeah, okay. So that's those are good. I now I see it. Thank you for giving me a little bit of uh, direction there, Stacy. Uh, how do you think the hiring process will change in this next season? Well, I'm actually writing a post about that, and I don't know if this is true, but I'll. Uh, here's my assumption. A third of the people, recruiters, will be exa do exactly the same thing. A third of the recruiters will get a little bit better, and a third will say, I'm going to totally revamp my hiring process. I'm focusing on the third that wants to totally revamp the hiring process. Uh, and I'll answer Jill's question in a moment, but that's what I'll – that's Connie's question. And I – Content. And I just talked to president of a RPO this morning. He's got about 70 recruiters. Well, they're all kind of out of work right now, but 70 people on his team, huge RPO. 
And I mentioned to him, I'm not going to tell you the guy's name, but uh, many people in the talent community know him. We just chatted about, are you going to go back to business as usual or are you going to be different? And if you want to go back to business as usual, you'll, you'll continue to post boring job descriptions. You'll still weed out the week. You'll still have hiring managers who make their silly decisions who aren't trained. Uh, but if you want to fundamentally change it, you have to have an end-to-end -end process. Now, he's familiar with performance-based hiring and win-win hiring. And I said, we've been talking about this for four years for you to embed this process. Intellectually, he knows it would work, but he's never had the time to do it. He said, now might be the time to do it. So in my mind, there's going to be people who are just going to go back to business as usual, and that cartoon will not change at all. There's going to be people who said, fun, and I also talked to another person who's dealing with a lot of VCs this morning, which was an earlier call. He's got 15 recruiters. They realize that they don't want to go back to business as usual. Their search business has dropped in half to a third of what they had. They're saying, hey, we want to now, it's now time to invest into something different. So that leads to Jill's question is why is the hiring process not evolved in the last 22 years? I'm going to contend that we're so busy weeding out the weak, we don't understand what it takes to hire the best. And to some degree, I'm going to contend that it's talent leaders and business executives have been conned. They've been conned into thinking that a better interview is going to improve hiring. They've been conned into thinking that a better sourcing technique is going to interview better hiring. They've been conned into thinking that a competency model is going to be universal help. And I'm going to contend because you're thinking a step, not complete system, uh, you focus on mistaking activity for progress. And all of a sudden people are saying, whew, the world has just changed. We now have a chance to change it and think hiring as an end-to-end -end business process. Hiring for the anniversary date, not the start date. Uh, focusing on attracting the best, not weeding out the weak. I don't know that that's the exact answer, Jill, but that's what I've been living with. Now, we have clients around the world who try our, this process. They know it's challenging. They know it's hard. Uh, but it does, in fact, work. But it's easy, the, maintaining the status quo and being a little bit more efficient seems to be easier. I could actually retire. You can tell that I'm an old guy, 73, be 74 soon. Thought about retiring, but now all of a sudden I said, hmm, maybe this is the opportunity with everybody taking a deep breath and what they should do is, hey, let's have a big fundamental goal. Let's just change the world. And it's not rocket science what I talk about here. It just seems common sense to me, but I'll tell you, it's hard to implement common sense when uh, the world is already thinking about uh, being more efficient. So any thoughts or comments? Does that make sense, Connie, Jill, Mary, Joe? Uh, what does everybody think? Stacy, what's your take on that? Uh, Jill's question. You've been around for 10 or 15 years, not as long as I have, but what do you think on this whole thing? I think that was a good assessment. This is a this is your performance-based um, hiring show, Lou. I think you came up with an excellent formula, and I think what I, I probably like about it the most is um, that ability to look deep into what somebody has done in the past and that be a dictator of what they're going to be able to do in the future. And I think that is just like the core of what the performance-based hiring is. And it starts at all levels. I mean, it's, it's, it's from that initial conversation that you have on the phone to interviewing them on, um, on their, their qualifications and also the intake meeting with the hiring manager. Well, I was telling a story this morning, which I'll say now about that point, Stacey. Uh, if anybody's interested, and I'll still tell the story because I was talking to a recruiter. He said, do you have any examples of where your process works? So I said, this is an old example, but it turned out to be my biggest client in the 90s. I don't do much recruiting, but so I started the train. People started jumping onto the training in the late 90s and early 2000s. So our company, the search firm split off from the training company. Uh, but I remember going to a company, and it had to be the mid-90s, a company about $100 million in Southern California, manufacturing company made test equipment, uh, imported some and built it as well. And they heard about our approach by defining work as a series of key performance objectives. So I walked into this company, it was in LA area, and wanted to search, talking to the CEO. And as I walked in, it turned out there were three other search firms in the room, me and one other big well-known one and another one that I had never heard of. Uh, and we were all trying to get this search for, a, I think it was a VP marketing or VP sales. And it was a big, big project at the time. 
retain search. And the only reason, and each of us was supposed to have a half hour there. I didn't realize that. So I said, ah, it's not right because I was supposed to be there at 8.30 or 9 and it could be here till uh, 10 or 11. Uh, but neither here nor there, it was a piece of business I wanted to get. So it turned out, hey, well, they took us by alphabetical order. So that was good. I got in first. So this is what the president told me I did afterwards. I don't exactly remember the story this way. But he said, I took looked at the job description. It had a list of skills, experiences, the academic background, wanted a smart person, wanted this kind of IQ and all this. And I looked at it and said, you know, this is not a job description. This is a person description. A job doesn't have academics. A job doesn't have an IQ. A job doesn't have uh, 10 years of experience or a list of skills. A job is what a person needs to do. Now, I don't remember actually doing what I'm about to say, but the president said I absolutely did it. Well, I took that job description and said, this is not a job description. I crumpled it up and threw it in the wastebasket and actually hid it in the wastebasket. So that part was true. And he said, what are you doing? I said, yeah, this is useless. My firm does not use job descriptions. What do you want this person to do to be successful? What's the biggest objective this person needs to achieve after a year? And it was put together, something like putting together a big product roadmap, organizing the engineering, the marketing, and the sales team to make sure that everything's done right. The next one was kind of understand the current product roadmap and upgrade it and et cetera, et cetera. But there's four or five objectives. And I said, I will be able to find someone who can do this work. And I pulled that job description out of the paper. These other two search terms in the other room are going to look at this and think they can do it, and they will not get there. And I was already in, I was only supposed to have a half hour. I was only supposed to, uh, and then the secretary came in at exactly that moment when I pulled it out and said, they can do this. I'll find somebody who can do the work, which I wrote on the billboard, on the white, whiteboard. The president said, no, could you, he said this real time. He said, no, we're going to, we've already decided to hire Lou for this search. Tell the other search terms we're sorry, uh, but we decided to use Lou's performance-based hiring. And I told the search firm this morning the same story. That's how it, I thought of it. I hadn't thought of it for 20 plus years. Uh, we ultimately placed probably 10 or 12 people over the next three or four years with this company. He wrote a, uh, a component, there was a story in a second or third edition of Hire With Your Head, where this guy, the president of this company, said, I hired 20 people in the last four or five years working on my staff, direct staff. Only one of them was a failure. And that was the one where I didn't build a performance-based job description when I hired somebody, I used my gut reaction based on the wrong criteria. I will never do that again. So that was a pretty good story. Uh, but it's the idea of if you want to differentiate your process, you got to start with the intake meeting, define a job, and find a person who's competent and motivated to do that job and receive the job as a career move. That's the domino that starts the whole process properly. Once you take a shortcut, you will never get there. You'll be maybe 10% more efficient, a little less cost, a little quicker time to fill, but you will not hire better people. So that's the story that I have to tell. I still do it today from my first assignment to helping a company hire somebody to run a CEO for a $150 million agricultural firm six weeks ago. Um, same process, still works. Everyone wants to hire a great person, but you have to have a process designed to hire great people, not designed to weed out weak people. And that should be a message everyone should take home and list. So, uh, Jill, that should be why the hiring process has not evolved. It's hard work. And we're actually creating a class um, for job seekers. And I'm, did I send you that link, Jay? Uh, I think I did. Did I send you the job seeker link, uh, Stacy? Um, I don't think I did. Let me see if I can working. find it. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. I'm going to put this in chat, but I don't know where it is. This is something, oh, I'm, just so you guys know, I'm putting together a course for job seekers. I'm going to give it away free for job seekers. It's how to ace the interview. Part of it starts with asking forced choice questions where a candidate who's in there believing he or she is not being interviewed properly just stops the interview and says, hiring interview or recruiter or hiring manager say, can you tell me a little about the performance objectives of this job? Because I'd like to give you some examples of work that I've done that's most related. That's the opening of a forced choice question. Now, the course itself is going to be about an hour long. We'll have lessons. We'll have videos. We'll have quizzes. We're giving it away to job seekers. We're even giving it away to recruiters who want to prep their candidates uh, 
using that. And I prepped 100% of my – well, that's not true. If a candidate is not a great interviewer, I would prep them. Usually if someone's a director above, they should be good enough. I might just give them a few tips. But generally speaking, when you get a manager or a staff person three or four years, they might not be great at interviewing. I want to make sure they're a good performer. They can do the work, and they're a good interviewer. So that course will be available. We've already got a call from UNICEF. They Can you help this for underdeveloped countries or people on this job seeker class? So it's going to be a pretty cool class. The one we're developing is for professionals and above, uh, let's say two to three years. Well, it could be entry-level professional and above, but uh, uh, we're starting to see a lot of momentum with this class. As officially, it will be available probably in about two weeks, and we're going to, all our recruiters who come to our training will see it. I think I gave you one. I think this is one. Let me just put hiring.tips slash partnership. This isn't the one. This is the course that we're offering to people. Um, because we, we do some unusual stuff, how we train recruiters and hiring managers. So let me leave it at that. If anybody has any more questions, I'll be happy to ask them. But I think we've kind of covered the key things that I wanted, personally wanted to cover. And now it's open to everybody if they want to ask questions. Stacy, what's your thoughts? What, what about some final comments here, Stace? You know, I think the, um, the key to all of this, Lou, and your program is just staying consistent with your hiring. I don't think if you have, if you don't have a consistent process that all of your recruitment team can follow, you don't have any way to measure that performance. And that's really the key thing. If you know where somebody is beginning and you know where somebody ends, then you can always measure the time to fill or all the typical ratios that you you would do to to measure that performance but unless you have a consistent model where everybody is going to follow along the same way you can't really measure what's happening and i know that i've 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 stepped into processes where people didn't even know how to dq disqualify a candidate within the applicant tracking system there were so many holes within the process and that i believe is really how the recruitment process falls apart i think somebody had asked how come it hasn't evolved in the last 22 years? And I think there typically has been in recruitment high turnover. There's a lot of different new recruiters who come through the, the door and the onboarding process is not consistent. And Lou, you have something that is a course that you offer for corporations when they're onboarding new recruiters or they have recruiters have been in the system for a long time and you wanna get them all in the same process, all on the same page so you can have measurable results that that is a course that you offer. And so I think it begins there and being able to be consistent with your process and getting everybody on the same page. And then the second thing is, Connie, you mentioned where will the hiring process be in the next season? And I think it's really gonna be in adopting and embracing AI technologies. What Lou's talking about with the humanization, with all the key touch points with everybody you talk to, how you engage with them, how you assess performance, that has all got to remain standard because knowing where somebody's come from to dictate where they're going to go is, is what Lou is talking about and how you engage every step of the way. But being able to be efficient with automating your process with new tools and technologies, that's going to be key and being able to embrace new tools like Hacker Earth and Seek Out and Hire Tool, all these really great sourcing tools to bring into your, your capabilities and in your process, that's going to be the next level. Okay. So we have um, our learning labs um, every week and you can find those at techrecruit.io and I think one of our hiring managers, actually it was the keynote at our last conference here in Los Angeles, Noelle Hunt Bennett, she's the senior leader for sourcing for Uber, who's hiring like crazy right now. She said, one of the hardest things for me to do in hiring my recruitment and sourcing teams is making sure that they understand really good technology like AI and how to use hire tool, how do you seek out, how to use these amazing tools. And I can't get budget to bring those tools on unless recruiters know how to use them. So all of our learning labs, including this one, Lou, is all about training recruiters on their process and their technologies. So that's what we're going to be doing throughout the summer. So thank you, Lou, for being part of this. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again, Stacey. Thanks. Bye-bye now. All right. Take care. Bye.